All right, next on the agenda, we have a very special guest. I don't want to introduce him because I don't want to mess up his credentials, so I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, I'm going to load up the presentation. The person listed on the presentation, he's not here yet. I'm not sure if he's going to join us, but the floor is yours, my friend. All right, good afternoon, my name is Chief Waller. Uh, I'm a nuclear engineer for the United States Navy. I've been in the Navy for 20 years. I'm an engine, I grew up in Buffalo, New York. Uh, it's really cold, snows a lot. Uh, I can tell you right now that uh, nuclear power is not something I ever knew that I ever wanted to do or didn't really know anything about when I was in high school. Uh, I graduated from high school, went to college for a little bit, loved college, hated classes. If you guys don't know what that means, you're doing college wrong. Uh, I was one of those kids that in high school I was smart, but I didn't apply myself. I don't want you to tell me that. Uh, and the nuclear power program was something that has actually been great for me because it actually forced me to live up to my potential. Uh, as a nuclear engineer, we actually make power for all submarines and all aircraft carriers in existence right now. There are no more con conventional submarines or aircraft carriers. Uh, today, I want to talk to you a little bit about the program. Uh, so just so you're aware, this is actually a, a, a high school level class or, or presentation uh, written by Naval Reactors. They're our bosses. Uh, basically what this is, is it's, it's scrubbed for any confidentiality because a lot of the stuff we do is classified. Uh, however, we go into more high schools and we do colleges. so. Some of it's uh, definitely geared toward them. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. I'm an open book. Anything I can't tell you, I'll just tell you it's classified. I, I can't tell you that, but Google has a lot of information that's not supposed to be there. I guarantee, <laughs> I guarantee that. We had to scrub it a couple years ago. We found a lot of stuff that wasn't supposed to be there. Uh, that's an aircraft carrier. That's actually George H.W. Bush. I was lucky enough to build that aircraft carrier. Uh, I built her from the ground up from 2007 to 2012. <clears throat> I actually got to turn on the reactors for the first time. I was part of the initial criticality crew. That was pretty cool. Uh, lots and lots of really big head engineers from naval reactors and other various organizations were there when we turned it on. It was, it was pretty interesting and then we got to see do sea trials. Uh, I don't think I was on board for the Blue Angel picture, but uh, it's, it's pretty cool when you get to go out to sea and do even special ops like that. Uh, an aircraft carrier right there is about 1,100 feet long. It's about almost 90,000 uh, 90, to 100,000 tons, depending upon when we're, when we're loaded up and where we're going. And it's uh, roughly... 5,000 to 5,500 people, depending upon our air wind complement when we go underway. So it's really a floating city, uh, tucked into one small little area. 18 stories tall, from the very top all the way down to the parts you can't see underneath the water. Uh, the guy who created this likes me, so if you're if you're a Marine or a former Marine, you'll, you may understand that. The Marines don't have equipment, they basically borrow it off from the Navy. They, they have their own aircraft, but again, the Navy runs them and sponsors them. So when the Marines go underway, they have to go underway with us. So realistically, we are like Uber for the Marines. If, if you haven't known any Marines, I can tell you what Marines stands for. Just, I can't do it in public. <laughs> Ask them. It's not funny. It's, well, it's funny to me. It's not funny to them. Um, all right. So again, we gear this toward a junior, a junior level, in, or um, juniors and seniors in high school. So we go over sources of energy. Thank you very much. Uh, so we go over sources of energy, hydroelectric, wind, and solar. All very good forms. However, realistically, wind energy is only about 35% efficient. So you're paying hundreds of millions of dollars to build these things. Those giant blades on those windmills you see are about three to five million dollars a piece just for the blades. And they have to be replaced every couple of years because the blades do get damaged. And on top of that, they don't start on their own. It takes a lot of energy to get them turning to begin with. So you need a lot of wind to keep it going and more likely you need a lot of energy to start it. So overall efficiency is only about 35%. If you're a company that's not really a turnaround for profit. It's also not really good for us as a country for using a lot of energy. Again, fossil fuels being the predominant way that we get our energy here in the United States, coal, petroleum, and natural gas. Again, my buddy likes memes. Uh, there really is, realistically, there really is only a finite amount of the fossil fuels because there was only a finite amount of dinosaurs, as he put it. And we can only turn that into so much gas. We are using more, in 2019, 2020, they predict we're gonna use upwards of 15% more than we have in the past decade. And that's just due to growth of population, growth of industry, growth of a couple other things. Unfortunately, the other thing we're doing is we are damaging the environment. Now, again, I'm not gonna argue environmental science, I'm not gonna argue politics with you, but this is a proven fact that we are putting a bunch of CO2 emissions into the environment. Now, you notice that each one, including nuclear, does have a carbon footprint, but our carbon footprint is so much smaller than the average fossil fuel plant that at some point in the future, whether we don't run out of fossil fuels or not, we're gonna have to look at this and say, all right, there's gotta be a better way to do this. Other sources of energy production, biomass, waste, tidal, and geothermal, again, all amount for roughly 6% or less of the amount of energy we're producing here in the United States. This is a statistic from 2016 for energy production where nuclear was only roughly around 20%. Now in the past two years, we've lost more nuclear plants because of age, because of deregulation, and because of a couple other things. 
And mostly what's going on right now is we don't have engineers qualified to operate them. The Navy can only pump out so many engineers a year where we're trying to keep our own people in while still giving them back to the, the United States government and saying, here, you go work for Duke Energy, or you go work for TVA or someone else running these power plants. Well, without the bodies to do it and with the age of these plants, we're having to shut them down. So that number is starting to dwindle, which is why the other ones are starting to grow and we're using more fossil fuels than we can produce right now. Uh, that right there is the Enterprise. She was the first nuclear aircraft carrier uh, built in the late 50s. That's one, a famous picture for the Navy. Uh, they actually, those, that E was MC Square is actually sailors up on the flight deck in their whites where they were actually able to spell that out. Uh, that was actually one of the more famous pictures of the Navy's nuclear power program. Okay, one gram raisin of, of pure uranium is, equi is equated into a pure energy. It's equivalent to 10,000 tons of TNT. Now, more importantly, let me ask you a question, and please be honest. How many of you hear the word nuclear and think that picture in your head? And be honest. Half? Okay. That's, that's more, than, more than double that in any high school class that we would normally get. Because realistically, a lot of people in this generation see nuclear or hear nuclear and they think that because of video games, movies, or other various things that have happened in the world. People like us engineers, we don't think that. We hear the word nuclear and we think power, production, safe, things like that. But I understand because of the way that we've all been raised and because of the way that media portrays the nuclear industry, this is what a lot of people think. I will tell you right now, it is not physically possible. Now, all of you have taken physics, most likely at some level, all of you understand how, how, how the situation or the vision works. This is not physically possible for a nuclear power plant to do. In order to get that type of reaction, you need to weaponize uranium. And when, you, when I say weaponize it, Nuclear fuel in a reactor, which we'll, we'll talk about in a few minutes, is at such a, slow, a low level. You could try to blow it up in this state, and it, physically it is not possible to do. By weaponizing it, you actually take it four to five different times over so what we use it as in our program. So I can tell you right now, from the nuclear power plants that we operate to any power plant in the world, this cannot happen to one of those. That's a weaponized version of uranium, or most likely plutonium. Uh, we talk about fusion real fast. A lot of the kids don't understand fusion. I can tell you right now, if you don't know, that is the only working fusion reactor in existence. It's in Great Britain. They've gotten fusion to happen for somewhere between five to 10 seconds. In those five to 10 seconds, their instruments went offline. They couldn't understand what was going on. They said, all right, let's try this again. So they hardened their instruments, and when they did, the center of that reactor got six times hotter than the sun. They were able to prove that using calculations. Great, awesome, five seconds worth of, of energy for that much that much heat, we'll be able to harness that, right? No, they have no idea what to do with it yet. Right now, this is basically just experimental, and they're using it to try to figure out a way to eventually use this to get to the point where we could use it for energy. They're 50 plus years off what in their own research. Now again, someone in this room might be smart enough to go help them, I'm not. Uh, but I can tell you right now, fission is the way of the future, and it will be until we figure out a way that, to safely uh, create power where we don't have to have fission. Now again, I'm not going to go into the pool ball theory, which is what we used to teach it to the high school kids. We don't really talk about more than that. But I can tell you this, in our fission in, in nuclear power for the Navy, we use uranium-235 for one reason, one reason alone. It is the most stable and most dominant form of uranium that can give us a reasonable uh, statistical model that we can say, okay, if I start my core today and I have my initial fission today, odds are, based on the way that we model our, our core, uh, again, it's not like a gas tank where we just dump fuel into, some, in, into a big tank and burn it out. Our cores are so specialized that if one fuel pellet, which is, by the way, that man's holding an actual uranium fuel pellet. That is an actual uranium fuel pellet he's holding his hand. It's roughly the size of a pencil eraser. If one of those fuel pellets is one micrometer off in a Navy nuclear reactor, it will throw our flux off and will roughly kill five to seven years of our core. The average Navy nuclear reactor on a submarine lasts 30 years. A 30-year lifespan is very important in the Navy. Why? That's the lifespan of a submarine itself. You can only go up and down in a submarine so many times before the hull begins to degrade and you have stress fractures in the hull itself. So after 30 years, the submarine has to be put to seat, put, out, put to bed, basically. They'll take everything out of it, scrap her, turn her into razor blades, turn her into a reef, or in some cases, turn her into a train facility for our guys. Those fuel pellets aren't just placed by hand. They're actually placed by a computer. But again, that's what we do. Civilian side, they have the same basic type of thing, they have the same basic process, except they basically just dump it into a big fuel matrix. A big fuel matrix like that gentleman sitting in front of, and basically just put it in these giant fuel cells. And each one of those fuel cells is massive. 
Each one of those fuel cells has some form of moderator, and that cross right there is normally hafnium or some other neutron absorbing material. They will draw all their rods out, activate the entire core at once, and burn all of their fuel as fast as they can. Effectively, think of taking your foot in your accelerator, slamming it to the floor, and just leaving it there, going as fast as you can in your car. Well, realistically, they want to do that. Why? They're selling you a product. They're selling you energy. In the Navy, we don't do that. We have these giant aircraft carriers. We have these giant submarines that need to pull in and out of port. Well, my buddies right now are at, at sea. They're burning their nuclear reactor. They burn it at 100%? No. We actually operate our rods such that we get a different flux in the core, so they're at various different levels. Against class, probably we can't talk about it too much. But I can tell you that the way we draw our rods out, again, is specialized down, that if one of those rods is out of place, the flux in the core will change and we will actually cause damage to the core, again, taking life away from the core. The average nuclear aircraft carrier's core will last you about 22 to 25 years, depending upon life expectancy, meaning if I'm operating heavily uh, for one, one year cycle and my effectable power hours is 300 more than we expected, we're going to have less life in the core. Uh, the Lincoln, who was just refueled a couple years ago, she was almost past her life expectancy when she pulled into a refuel. She was past 23,000 full effect power hours. We've only calculated out to 22.2. She was well beyond that, so they had to recalculate a lot of things and do a lot of let's just say uh, crazier stuff that my friends have never seen before. And, and again, I've been doing this 20 years, I've seen some crazy stuff in the Navy. But a fuel rod, fuel assembly is the same basic, basic program for any, any type of nuclear agency. It's just how well you control your flux and burn of the fuel to how long your cores are gonna last. We just, in the Navy, we just do it a little better than most people because of the way ours are designed to do. Does everybody understand? Any questions about that? All right. So one kilogram of uranium which he's holding in his hand, that's equivalent to roughly the size of one kilogram of uranium, it will equate out to all of those individual things. So 42 million cans of Red Bull, 5.1 million Big Mac meals, but more importantly, one kilogram of uranium. That small amount of uranium in that man's hand was powering the first nuclear submarine, the USS Nautilus. We only used one kilogram of uranium to power an entire submarine for over 60,000 nautical miles traveled around the world. She was the first submarine to go into the polar ice caps. She was the first submarine to surface through the polar ice caps. She was the first submarine to do a lot of things that are classified still to this day, including the one I can tell you about, which was she parked herself in a Russian port right next to one of her submarines, popped her periscope up, took pictures, and then went back home. We sent them to the Russians and said, we were there, you didn't even know it. <laughs> they think it was really the start of the Cold War, but they were probably other stuff before that. But the Russians and the Americans have gone back and forth a lot over nuclear power, uh, both good and bad. But I can tell you right now, in the late 2000s, we, we jumped so far ahead of them because of how bad the, the country was over there that our technologies kept increasing. Recently, the Russians have made a giant step in, in nuclear power, but our submarines are still very sought after and our, and our information is still very sought after. Uh, we are, are the only nuclear agency with a perfect safety record as well. Uh, core construction is pretty, pretty similar in both civilian and nuclear power for the Navy. Uh, all of your moderators, uh, it's all water. So there are other methods out there right now, uh, not used by the Navy, but some of the civilian plants are thinking of using thorium. Uh, they're using a liquid sodium, and then a couple other things right now that are being, ideas being tossed around as to feasibility of using other objects besides water. The Navy will use water again because it's safe and we understand how it's gonna function. We're not gonna put ourselves in jeopardy. The Russians in Chernobyl were using a boiling sodium reactor when, when Chernobyl happened, and we'll get into that a little later, but because of that, a lot of people in the industry stepped away from anything besides water. But I can tell you that if you do any research into it, there are other methods out there. We just happen to use water. So again, your control rods are in black, your fuel's in red, it's pretty obvious to pull your control rods out. The neutrons can then interact with the other uh, fuel, the uranium-235 and the fuel, creating more chain reactions, creating more heat, and so on. How do we use it in the Navy? If you can draw this and explain this, you can be a nuclear engineer. Dead serious. This is literally a four hour question if you ask how, me how to an answer it. To be a nuclear engineer, the very final question you get at your board, a bunch of people like me sitting on this side, you standing up there looking all nervous. They say, you're one atom of uranium-235, or I'm one atom of uranium, we don't tell you 235 because we want you to know that, but I'm one atom of uranium inside the reactor vessel, take me to the ocean. By the way, this is the ocean. Get me from point A to point B. It's a four hour question. Because, of course, every time you say something, I'll be like, okay, well, tell me more about that. Well, tell me more about that. Tell me more about that. Four hours later, after you're done shaking and you and you actually, you know, you walk out the room and we, we let you sweat it out a little bit, you walk in, we're like, congratulations, you passed. And you watch the kid pass out. You're like, oh, that was cute. <laughs> this is basic nuclear power 101 for anyone. 
I'll, I'll, I'll make it the, I'll give you the fast version. Inside the reactor vessel, all the chain reactions are happening. You have fission happening. You have a lot of heat being created. That heat is being drawn away by water. That red dotted line is actually water. That water is constantly in motion. Uh, heat transfer, fluid flow, thermodynamics. Is that covered in any of your classes? Yes, maybe. Yes, so yes. They, they cover that? So they cover it. Okay, okay, cool. Well, a lot of places don't cover it anymore, which is weird, unless you're specifically in that program now. So, heat transfer, fluid flow, thermodynamics says water is a better moderator than steam. However, water can only, even water can only take so much heat before it turns to steam. Well, we fix that by pressurizing our system. So that red system is pressurized. Can't tell you what it's pressurized to because it's classified. I also can't tell you what the temperature is because that's also classified. But it's fairly high into both, both of them, I can tell you that. So we need to get the heat out of the red water into the blue water. How do we do that? All those pipes, that's all metal piping, is, is run through that steam generator. Again, straight piping through more water. Well, what, heat wants to go where? Hot to cold, of course. So it transfers into the blue water. Blue water is not pressurized. That system does not, uh, it is not under pressure. So it will start to flash the steam. Here's the thing though, it doesn't just flash the normal steam. You don't just boil water, you see the steam water vapor mixture. Our water, our steam has to be so hot and so powerful, it can turn a turbine that's literally twice the size of this classroom. So look around your like, square classroom, now double it in size, that's how big some of our turbines are. That's how big our main engines are. So you need very high pressure, very high intensity steam. It also has to be super, super dry. If you get one cup of water into our steam system, you can turn turbine blading that's as thick as this into Swiss cheese. I physically held one in my hands that got a little bit of water carryover. We couldn't figure out what happened. Well, they went in and sure enough, a bunch of our turbine blading was just melted, just gone. And the one piece of blade that they found, we held it up and we were looking through it. I'm like, that's like six inches thick. That's not good. They found out what happened was we had a little bit of moisture carryover. And they had to go in and fix all that to the tune of $35 million because we don't own this stuff, we rent them. So we had to buy them and the company was not very happy with us. Luckily they had another thing they, they had broken a couple of years ago, so we were able to get it at a discounted price. <laughs> but attached to that turbine is gonna be a generator because again, an aircraft carrier submarine's underwater or in the middle of the ocean, we can't just plug into the grid, so we make our own power. We generate power on an aircraft carrier at 4,160 volts. Look above you, that's 120. You can imagine the safety features and the size of the generators we need to, to make power that high. We don't use it at that high necessarily. We use it at a 450 on average or 440 uh, for most of our equipment and then 120 for all your you know, lighting and peripherals and we have power for computers and everything else. But at 4160 we generate it for some of our larger equipment. Again, some of those pumps and some of those turning, uh, some of the pumps that turn the water can operate at 4160. And again, we talked about the main engines that are pushing you through the water. With that aircraft carrier I get, again, I said it's 90,000 to 100,000 tons. It's 1,100 feet long and it's 18 stories tall. It's one of the largest vessels that the military operates, period. What if I told you I could race certain cars in it and beat them? Would you believe me? Yeah. Yeah. 90,000 tons going 50 miles an hour? Yeah, it's pretty interesting, especially when you have little small ships. Those little small ships that's sitting there and they're going as fast as they can and the aircraft carrier goes blowing by it. My buddy's on the bridge going, how fast were you guys going? I was like, I can't tell you, <laughs> but it was fast. An aircraft carrier can move through the water, but again, we push through the, end, the water using four main engines, again, double the size of this room. It's a lot of horsepower. So in order to do that, we need a lot of steam. And then of course, while we're doing that and going that fast, I gotta be able to do the one thing an aircraft carrier was designed for, which is launch aircraft. So again, the top of that says catapults. We actually launch aircraft using steam. Now out of the 1,100 foot long aircraft carrier, only about 500 feet of it's actually usable runway. We have jets that are worth, I don't know, $100 million or more, some of them, let's say average they're about $70 million and weigh a good couple hundred tons. And I gotta get those up to 150 to 170 miles an hour depending upon weight. And I have 500 feet to do it. Most planes, commercial jets can't take off unless they're going about 250, 200, 250 miles an hour or more to get enough thrust. Well, we do it 500 feet using catapults. We literally attach an aircraft to a piece of metal and then on the back of that piece of giant slug of metal and just apply high pressure steam in the back of it and throw it off the front of an aircraft carrier. Uh, anybody ever been on the Superman ride at Six Flags or any one of those type of steam powered roller coasters around here? You, you know that feeling you get when it first kicks and you get that G-force kick? It's better than that because at the end of it, you drop off the aircraft carrier and then they turn straight up and go up in the air. It's pretty cool. I recommend doing it at least once. I've done both. I've done a trap and a launch. I recommend the launch, not, not so much the trap. Not as fun. Questions about how we use nuclear power. And then, of course, all the steam just gets recondensed down. So again, I told you, get me from the reactor to the ocean. 
well, by the time you get to this point, well, I just got used here in the turbine, so now I'm down here, I get condensed back into water and then using the system, but I don't want to do that, so I'm going to go into the ocean, I'm going to get reabsorbed into the water here, that's just straight seawater, depending on where we are in the world, anywhere from 80 degrees in the Gulf to my guys just left the Atlantic, said they were pulling in 15 degree water when they were up north of the, oh yeah, they were real cold. First time in, since the 80s we went up that north, and they were pulling in somewhere between uh, 15 to 25 degree waters, and then out to the ocean. That's nuclear power 101. Yes, sir. Are you using heavy or light water at the core? Just normal water. And how do you get rid of salt in the mission? So all of the so all of the red and all of this is purified water. We make our own water. So we take straight seawater from here, and then we run it through a distilling unit. It's a, it's a flash type distilling unit. Uh, they get distilled down one set of distilling. Then water goes two places. I can either drink it or I can send it back to us. Sending it back to us sends it through another demineralizer and another purifier system, which we can't really talk about too much, but I can tell you right now, uh, you would never want to drink this water because it's super purified. Then we bunch, dump, dump a bunch of chemicals in it, and that's how we use it here in the primary. And the secondary side, again, we just fill it with, with effectively middle waters. It's potable water, it's just purified one more time just to, just to prevent any type of uh, mineral deposits in, inside the steam system. And then on this side, we do get a lot of verdigree. We do get a lot of seawater bleed through in some of the valves and things like that. But that's what we have junior kids for to clean it. <laughs> Not so much at my level. <clears throat> that's a good question, though. Uh, we do make, like I said, we do make our own water. The only thing an aircraft carrier cannot do is make its own food. And we normally store enough food that we can last 30 to 45 days. And that's maximum. Again, 5,000 plus people at about 45 days. And that's max capacity. Where at about the 35 day point, we're starting to ration down. Uh, but again, in the middle of a zombie apocalypse, I'm going to an aircraft carrier. I know I can do everything there. I'm just not going to fly a plane. I'm just going to make the flight take into a farm. You think three o'clock in the morning when you're standing watch, you'll find ways to stay awake. This was our plan. We had it written down into a, like a ten-page manual. <laughs> the CO was impressed when he heard about it. Let's just put it that way. All right. Uh, we'll figure it out. We'll make it. Again, zombies can get chopped up and used as, as fertilizer. We're good. Uh, of course, if you're going to talk about nuclear power, you got to talk about the good and the bad. We talked about the good, and I got to talk about the bad. Everyone's always afraid. Now, you said some of you said you were worried about the, the, the nuclear bomb picture. Now, my next question is, if you don't, if you're not worried about the nuclear bomb picture, if I see the way nuclear, how many people are worried about the radiation of it? Everybody else, right? So let me ask you this: How many of you ate a banana this morning? Congratulations, you ate something radioactive. Yep. How old is this building? How old is this building? Fifty. Fifties. Fifty. Yeah. Fifty years old. Anything built between the 50s and 60s, all your bricks are radioactive. Here's the thing about radiation. You are exposed to more radiation every year in, in this country than I've received in my entire naval career. Because here's the thing, as, as my job entails, they have to track how much radiation I receive. The average American in the United States will receive 360 millirem of radiation a year. How many of you think that's high? And be honest, 360, that sounds like a lot, of, a big number, right? Until you realize 360 millirem is not a big deal. In order to get any type of actual problem, you have to get into the REM category. 25 to 100, 100 or more, where you start to actually have any type of problem. In my career in the Navy, I've received 298 millirem from the Navy. Now that's exposure from the Navy, not general exposure. That's trackable radiation. My 20 year career, I've received less radiation than the average American. Sub Submariners who go underwater and stay underwater for 90 days at a time, two to three times a year, will receive, more, receive less radiation from being on that submarine than they would just standing in this country and living in this country, never going underwater. The program is not as dangerous as people think it is. Nuclear power gets a bad rap. It's just like anything else. How many of you drove to campus today? Do you know what your statistical odds of dying in a car accident are? Has anyone ever done the research on it? Very extremely high. Over 20%. And that's passenger or driver, if you combine them. Here's the thing about nuclear power. People are scared of it because they don't know anything about it. People are afraid of it because they don't educate themselves on it. They believe what the media says. They believe what a TV show says, or in some cases, a video game says. The problem is you hear nuclear, you hear radiation, you automatically think something negative because that's the way we've, we've built our, our brains to, to function. Radiation is not the big dangerous thing it is. Yes, you can get any one of these number of things. You, nothing can happen. How many of you get a suntan every, every summer? How many of you go tanning, anything like that? You're cooking your skin cells using radiation. Like you, you watch these high school kids' minds blow when these girls are like, what? Yeah, you're actually cooking yourself with radiation. You do understand that, right? And they start to freak out. I'm like, you're not gonna die, you're fine. Because nothing happens. 
or in some cases, your cells die. You get a really bad suntan, you get a sunburn, right? your skin comes back. You don't die, you don't mutate, you don't have cancer. Your skin dies and, and rebuilds itself. Nothing bad happens. Genetically, yes, you can have radiation, you can have genetic effects. You do realize by looking around this room, you can pick four genetic effects radiation has had on the human population over the millennia, and you don't even realize it's from radiation. Anyone want to guess? I'm going to just give you the answer. Is it, is it one of those classes that's got to give the answer? Yeah. <laughs> Skin color, eye color, hair color, and facial structure have all been mutated based on where your, gener where your ancestors lived. Do enough research, and I've done the research because I, want, I wanted to see if this was true, and it is true. They can now prove that every single one of us, no matter where we come from in the world, all came from one area a very, 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 very long time ago. We all look the same. As the continent shifted, as the population moved around, we had to change. The body had to physically change. And that's from exposure to the sun and other environmental impacts and environmental factors. You can still see it now. Over the past 200 years, they've seen changes in, in cultures where they can see what people looked like 200 years ago to now. Just changes in local areas. It's very interesting. But again, when you get into that type of research, you realize radiation's had an effect on it, but not just radiation sun exposure and other environmental factors and then of course cancer yes i can never tell you that radiation is not 100 percent safe there are possibilities to get cancer but your possibilities of getting cancer increase exponentially with what you do with it like smoking why is smoking so bad it's not because of what's in the cigarettes it's the alpha particles you're putting into your body look at the radiation you receive per year from from smoking cigarettes have alpha emitters in them not the tobacco. I smoke cigars all the time. Cigars are safer than cigarettes because cigars are basically just smoking straight natural leaf. When you smoke natural leaf cigar, cigarettes, it's the same type of thing. It's the chemicals and everything else that go through the filter and everything else. That's what you put in your body. That's why it's so high. And then x-rays. I, I have a spinal injury. But the, my lower spine is basically destroyed. I used to get three to five x-rays every other week. So I get a lot of dose. I had a lot of doses due to x-rays. I don't glow, I don't have superpowers, I don't have cancer, anything like that. All they did was realize, all right, so my dosage was a little higher that month, okay. You have to, again, get into the high, high levels. Now look at some of those levels, and we're gonna talk about Chernobyl here in a minute, where people were going home and dying overnight, because they were re receiving millions of millirem over a very short time. All right, you guys are old enough to know that it is, right? All right, well some of the kids are like, I don't know who that is. I'm like, go watch The Simpsons, that's your homework. That's, that's Homer Simpson. Now, in the Navy, we have three types of, in the Navy nuclear power program, we have three types of jobs. I'm an electrician. I'm the one who makes all the power, generates all the power, and, and handles all the lighting. Homer Simpson would be an ET. He sits in front of the panel and actually operates the nuclear reactor. Hopefully, most of our ETs are smarter than him. Not all of them, but you know, most of them. And then we have mechanics who are in charge uh, of uh, water, steam, oil, air, all the systems that aren't electrical. Um, yeah. Anybody know what that thing on the right is called? Elephant's foot. It is the elephant's foot. That is a very classic picture from Chernobyl. Here's why. The person who took it died the next day. He received so much radiation while taking that picture that he literally went home and died in his sleep. Even worse, I'll talk with you on a second. That picture right there, also taken from uh, uh, Chernobyl, was taken from a helicopter. Now, back in the 80s, we didn't really understand radiation the way we do now. Radiation is omnidirectional. It goes in every direction at all points until you stop it somehow. Guess what? Those people in the helicopter did not understand the amount of radiation they were receiving. We are not near the reactor. We are above it. We are fine. Both of them started getting dizzy. Both of them started not feeling well. They showed signs of radiation poisoning. Oh, well, let's just land you. We'll give you some iodine. You'll be fine. They never woke up. They went home and their organs liquefied. So there is a, let's just say, not really a class. There's a thing that some of us in the engineering field have been able to go see. And it is super, super classified and super, super nasty. And I've seen pictures that will make any person who likes horror movies still get sick to their stomach. Because when you see these, the pictures from, of these guys and some of the other people who died in Chernobyl, it's worse than any horror movie you've ever seen. Because it's all real. Eyes melted, organs, or just liquid coming out of every organ. It's just, just destroyed. Every single, like, every single cell in their body just basically burst overnight. Yeah. So the best way to explain it would be almost like the um, one guy whose body melts in Indiana Jones. Yes. And like that. You are the third person to equate that out. Yes, just like that. Okay. It, but worse. Because it's well, real. Because oh, you know so, it's so real. everything melts. Yes, because it's real. Okay. Um, bone and effectively hair and something else was all that was left. It so was a, it's a mix cool. between that and the grandmother dying in um, Don J.C. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Now the thing about Chernobyl was this. The Russians were 
not using a standard reactor. They were using a, a boiling sodium reactor. They were attempting to effectively outdo the Americans, because again, in the mid age we were still in the middle of the Cold War, and they, uh, how can I put this nicely? They killed themselves. They violated procedure, took the reactor, super critical. When they realized the reactor was super critical, they tried to stop it. They only inserted about a quarter of the rods instead of all their rods. It was too late, they ended up getting a pressure explosion. Now again, I told you, reactors can't blow up. They can't blow up nuclear cell. That is a pressure explosion. That is the remnants of a reactor going super critical and causing a pressure surge and a pressure explosion. When the reactor blew up, it blew nuclear material, fissionable material, so far away that they found chunks of it hundreds of miles away in and around the area. More so, a lot of it was atomized. And because it was atomized, it blew up into the atmosphere and got everywhere all across the globe. Uh, again, I don't know if this is technically common knowledge, so please don't go repeating this, but you know the Americans went to DEF CON 3 that day, right? Yeah. Within a couple hours, all of our radiation detections in Alaska and some other areas that are classified started going off. We thought we were under attack. We thought nuclear weapons had been launched. So we went to DEF CON 3 until a bunch of other countries were like, hey, ours are going off too. And the Russians were like, oh, yeah, our bad. We had an incident in one of our plants. They didn't call it an accident. They didn't say, they said it was an incident. It wasn't until the, the uh, United Nations and World, War, World Health Organization and a bunch of other agencies started questioning that they were like, yeah, we had an explosion at a nuclear plant. And they went, what? And then, of course, everything kind of spiraled from there. Now, if you Google Chernobyl right now, you will not see this picture. You, what you will see is a giant sarcophagus. Now, the original sarcophagus was a giant concrete dome that was built over to protect the environment and protect the world. The sarcophagus is so irradiated that the concrete is starting to break down at its fundamental level. So they built another sarcophagus, the new dome over it, which is supposed to protect us in case the other one collapses on itself, which is probably going to in the next couple of years. That place is still so radioact radioactive that you still can't go there. Now, if you ever played the original, one of the original Call of Duty's, I think it was Modern Warfare 1, and you go to the one with the Ferris wheel, and, and that, that's actually Chernobyl. Yeah. So the makers of that game actually got permission to go and actually do video game background, and that's actually Chernobyl they use in that game. Same thing with Chernobyl Diaries. Now, here's the one th funny thing about that. When the Chernobyl Diaries people were there actually filming on location, half the crew got radiation poisoning. Not because they were going anywhere bad, but they didn't understand, like, hey, this yellow sign, it, you're safe in this spot, like you step four feet that way, radiation. Because it's that crazy radioactive there, like when you're that close, like this ground can be contaminated, and it, but as long as you're over here, you're still good. So half the crew got radiation poison. Now they're all fine, but they all had to be flown home and been given different treatments and things like that. And then Fukushima is the one that everybody knows about because it's more recent, everybody should know what happened there. The biggest thing there was, Fukushima could have been prevented if the people who owned the plants actually did the safety features that they were told to do. Uh, they just skimped on the price and didn't take their, their third safety features were not as hardened to the system. The first one went out, okay, no problem. Second one dies out, sure, we've got a third backup. But their backup to their backup system wasn't built correctly because they wanted to save money. Because again, they're a business and they skimped on it. When the third system failed, their reactors got super, super hot, boiled over, got some damage to the core itself. Still in containment, everything's fine. And then the Japanese government got involved and said, dump a bunch of seawater on it. Before talking to the Americans, before talking to us, we, we were told them, it's already broke, don't try to fix it. When well, they dumped a bunch of extra water on there, water in the presence of nuclear flux will break down to hydrogen and oxygen. There was a lot of burning equipment, there was a lot of exposed electrical equipment there. As soon as the power came back on, all that gas exploded. You can actually hear explosions going off in some of the video footage from Fukushima. If you go back and look at any of it, and I remember watching it because my buddies were over there on the rig and doing cleanup for it. And I remember hearing explosions going off. I'm like, what the heck? And then I started doing the, the, the calculations and the math. Here's the funny thing. It wasn't the Japanese government cleaned this up or figured it out. It wasn't the American government's nuclear regulatory committee. It was us. The United States Navy's nuclear propulsion program and our naval reactors went over there in mass and helped figure out cleanup, helped figure out what happened. We were the ones, my buddies on the Reagan that did the, the cleanup and did some of the, um, for lack of a better term, fixing of the problems that were over there. Now, I will, I will told you uh, nuclear power is super safe, right? I, I keep telling you that, like you have nothing to worry about. Yes, there was an increase in background radiation from, from both this one and Three Mile Island, which happened here in the States. The one in Three Mile Island, 80 bananas. 80 bananas worth of radiation was, was released in the environment. The nearest town didn't even get a background radiation increase. Right around the plant, they got a background radiation increase of 0.005 from 80 bananas worth, which is 0.008.
So the back irradiation, because of where it leaked into, because of this spread of the, everything into the into the water, the back irradiation was was barely detectable. The only reason we even knew it was there is we went looking for it. Fukushima, on the other hand, the general area around it has increased in, in and around that area by a lot. Uh, I, we don't have the exact numbers because the Japanese government is very, very not friendly about releasing certain information like that, but I can tell you that my buddies who are on the Reagan know that they've seen back radiation increases on the ship of a, by about 0.1 to 0.2. Again, not that big of a deal. They, they can definitely fix it or, or definitely deal with it. Not that big of a deal. However, the people in California were freaking out about people in Hawaii who were like, oh my God, all this radiation is going to hit our coast. Yes, that is true. We did get radioactive material. We have seen a radiation increase in both the coasts. 0 0.002. Again, so minimal that you could eat two bananas and you'd be equivalently the same. So radiation is not the big, big, bad, scary thing everybody thinks it is. And of course, the third thing that goes along with nuclear power is always the waste byproduct and storage. Up until a couple years ago, yes, we basically take liquid waste, liquid storage, put it in a bunch of drums, put it into a bunch of boron containers, put those into other containers and bury them in the ground. New technology, and this is great now. You see that thing in that guy's hand? That's a glass bead of nuclear material used nuclear material that he's holding in his hand. So there's now a new, a new way, again, some of it's classified, some of it's proprietary. I, I tried to look it up and they won't even tell me. They basically take a glass uh, mixture of boron and mixed in some other elements that are very, very neutron absorbing and very, very malleable. Basically put it down into a, a molten glass tube and then cut them into these beads. And then the beads get put into other containers which then get put in the ground. So such that if for some reason there ever was an earthquake or something were to rupture, the beads themselves would still be able to, would be in a solid form instead of a liquid form. And then of course the, everything gets buried in some type of more filler material, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the Navy only uses one dump site. It is in this country. It is in a state that's up near Seattle. Uh, the state that nobody wants to go to, although your potatoes are pretty big if you get them from there. <laughs> A little bit of radiation. But yes, my buddy used to work for them, uh, would actually transport all the material. Very safe, very classified, very, very, very heavily guarded. Guarded for one reason, one reason alone. Not so much they worry about the actual uh, potential for a problem, but for people trying to steal the used material. Used material cannot be used as a bomb. As far as the nuclear type mushroom cloud, used material can be used for dirty bombs. Again, if you watch any TV shows, movies, things like that, you know what a dirty bomb is. It's basically just a regular bomb that explodes nuclear material all over the place, causing contamination and panic. Uh, we talked about how we use it. We use it for propulsion, we use it for energy, and we use it for launching aircraft. Again, that, that catapult system there. 150 to 170 miles an hour in two seconds. Again, better than any roller coaster ride you will ever be on in any amusement park. Okay, and again, so we gear this toward high school students, so we tell you you need a background in algebra, chemistry, and physics, because again, that's everything that our program touches on. Realistically, here's the stuff people care about. These numbers are a little outdated. We did get some new upgrades to our, our pay charts recently. So you come in the Navy as an E3. Now, basically what that means is the day you leave for boot camp, we start paying you an E3 pay grade. Right now, that's over $2,000. $2,000 a month just to get paid to go to school. For the first two months, you go to Great Lakes, Illinois, that's where boot camp is. Everybody learns how to be in the Navy for two months. We all go through the same thing. After that, you go to A school. I told you there's three ratings, electro electronic technician, Homer Simpson, uh, electrician's mate, me, God's rate, that's what we are, God's rate. And then the mechanics are uh, three months long. After A school, they automatically advance to the E4, so you automatically get a pay raise. You've now been in the Navy roughly eight months. You're, you're in E4, you're making $2,200 a month as an E4. Anybody here making that much money? Getting paid to go to school? That's what we do, we pay to go to school. Here's the part that everybody really cares about. Power school. Power school is an MIT-based program. When I say MIT-based program, we stole MIT's program and made it better. You can go to MIT, you can pay them a lot of money to teach you this program in roughly two years. I'm gonna teach you in six months. We don't, we cut out everything that doesn't matter. We teach you nuclear physics, heat transfer fluid thermodynamics, radio, uh, radioactive fundamentals, uh, intro to metallurgy, reactor operations, and nuclear physics, and a whole bunch of other stuff in six months. At the end of it, you take one test called the comprehensive. It's a four hour long test, about the size of a small book. It is the single hardest test I've ever taken in my life. People have nervous breakdowns studying for the test, people have nervous breakdowns during the test, people have nervous breakdowns while waiting for the grades afterwards, and then when they fail, you watch them literally hit the ground and just start crying. Those of us who pass, we all just say, all right, find in the nearest, you know what, because I'm done for the day. Yeah, uh, it was literally like, we were all standing there, just, you just stand there, waiting for your name to get called. So they, drip, they take you all into a big circle, it's called brick over circle, and then one person stands up and reads grades off. And if you're at the bottom of the alphabet, W, you're waiting the whole time like, I hate all of you, just give me my grade so I can, oh God, I passed, then you can live. Yeah, because it's, it's the scariest thing I've ever been through, and I've been through some crazy stuff in my life. Six months, we teach you a two-year MIT-based program. 
And oh, by the way, I know you guys are here in, in order to get college credits. To a high school student, when I tell you, you get 77 college credits while doing this, and oh, I told you getting paid to go to school, you get 77 MIT, le MIT level credits. Yeah, a lot of colleges are really like that. My three degrees that I've gotten through the Navy, by the way, I paid zero dollars for those. Uh, all my colleges accepted all of them, because they like me, I don't know. I have a business degree, an a double E, and then my nuclear technology degree. I only got the third one because my boss made me. But he's me. I'm gonna go work for Facebook, making $200,000 a year when I get out of here, I'm good. Uh, after that we teach you, so we just taught you book smart. So now you under we understand you understand how to do it on paper, great. What college is gonna put you in a live nuclear reactor and tell you to go do it for six months? I will. You are gonna go operate a live nuclear reactor in one of two locations. In upstate New York, near, near Saratoga Springs, about 45 minutes north of Albany, we have two live nuclear reactors that we teach you on. Better yet, if you wanna stay in Charleston, we teach you on two submarines, actual Navy submarines that we have converted into training facilities. So you're gonna actually operate nuclear reactors. You're gonna do what we just taught you. Theory-wise, you're gonna go put your hands on it. If you're a mechanic, you're gonna turn valves and actually make stuff. If you're an electrician, we're gonna put your hands in a motor controller and you're gonna actually make electricity. If you're an uh, ET, you're gonna actually operate the shim switch and create and actually cause nuclear reactions to happen. You're gonna be Homer Simpson. We teach you how to do the job. You've now been in the Navy roughly 18 months, 20 months at the most, and you qualify as a nuclear operator. Oh, by the way, we now give you $40,000 as a bonus. So I'm paying you to go to school, I'm giving you college credits, and I just gave you a $40,000 bonus. Yeah, I like this job so far. And then you go to the fleet. In the fleet, you start doing your job. Now, depending upon what your rating is, your job can consist of any number of things. But more importantly, if you really like your job, and you really think this is something you want to do, I'll be like, you know what? You already got a six-year job. I'll add two more years, and I'll give you up to $100,000 in bonuses. That's not paychecks. That's still bonuses. And again, to a high school student who is making no money right now, when you tell them, oh, by the way, two years after being in the Navy, I'm going to give you $100,000, and I'm going to give you $2,600 a month, Plus BAH, you'll be making roughly around thirty-eight hundred dollars a month. Yeah, most of them are just like sign me up now because they don't <laughs> understand what real life is like yet. Most of you do because you've been here. And then you do your job. Effectively, our job consists of operating aircraft carriers, nuclear power plant, or submarine, and each one of those entails different things. My job consists of making sure that all the lights stay on, all the generators are operating, all the motor controllers run, and all the motors run. Uh, the ETs, they make sure that the brains of the reactor, all the computer stuff that, that operates the reactors itself works, uh, and they make sure that all of the nuclear instruments function and the mechanics basically do everything we don't do. Uh, make sure all the steam systems work, all the valves work, everything that's maintenance, all the air systems, all the oil systems, all the water systems, everything else that's not us, they own. Uh, again, advancement, bonuses, things like that. Realistically, what a lot of places like, places like Facebook and Google and Amazon and every power plant out there and everything else, it's not just the education they like, it's the experience. Because as a college student, you walk out with a piece of paper and say, I'm really smart, look at my degree. And they say, that's nice. As a nuclear engineer, I say, look at my degree and my six years of experience. Who do you think is going to get the job? And that's not me talking, that's every VP of every company that I've ever worked with. Because in Pittsburgh, when I did this job previously, we actually had the president of one of the Pittsburgh power companies come in, former Navy nuke, six year mechanic, said, I could not have gotten the job I got 50 years ago when he started doing this, that, that has put me as the president now without the Navy's power, nuclear power program. More importantly on top of that, well on top of that, you also get your secret clearance and specialized training, which again, people like, uh, as far as uh, people who want to employ me. Oh God, him and his memes. You like the memes, you think they're good. Somebody likes the memes. You understand, like, you have to explain this one to the college students, like, like well, they better know. They better know, I was gonna say, this is like, Math like one on like high school like algebra one maybe, and then of course um, you think punk badge from C mine. Ah. By the way, and then this is my favorite one. Yeah, we like your salt life sticker. That's cute. <laughs> he's a submariner. The other guy is supposed to be here. My my assistant. He's a submariner, so he thinks everything's all about yeah. submarines. I think he's stupid. Anytime you see a salt life sticker, it's either on a Jeep Wrangler or it's on somebody's car. That's true, actually, or a truck. Well, yeah, yeah. Alright, so that's nuclear power for the Navy in, in, in a nutshell. I, I, I kind of sped through because I know we were kind of short on time. Yes. Um, Patterson DeVito, who's the local Navy recruiter here, uh, he's going to pass out some surveys for you and then his business cards for anyone who's interested. The surveys are a way of us finding out if you do want more information and us contacting you so that we can talk one-on-one. -on -one. I give you more detailed background. We talk about requirements to join the program, et cetera, things like that. And then uh, the survey is also a chance for you to get information on any other Navy op opportunities or topics that are out there. Because we're one job out of, help me, 200 and some jobs in the Navy that we have. 
So I just happen to be a nuclear engineer and specialized that I've been doing this 20 years, so they bring me out here to talk to the STEM classes, AP physics for high schools, things like that, higher level classes that may be more apt to this program for people who are into engineering. Uh, I told you I have three degrees. I got my, I got my nuclear technologies degree, again, because my boss made me do it. I have my double lease and my electrical engineering degree, and I have a business degree because my wife and I are trying to start a business. So I just recently got that third degree. The Navy has paid for all of my degrees. I paid for no out-of-pocket costs for my degrees except for my books, but most of my books were cheap. So I think total complete out of cost, I'd say I'm under $1,000 for all three of my degrees. On top of that, I have experiences in the Navy that no one else can ever touch. I've met sitting presidents. I was re-enlisted by one of the presidents. I've met heads of state. I've ate and drank in countries I would never have been able to do uh, things that I've been in the Navy. I got to participate in certain uh, rituals in certain countries just because I was there at the right time. So there's a lot of stuff about our, the Navy in general that we don't necessarily touch on in this, but it's just one of those experiences in general. Does anybody have any questions? I talk fast. I'm from New York. I'm sorry. I have to forget I'm not always in a New York. I mean, it's, it's Jersey. You guys should be able to use this, right? Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. Speak as fast as you do. Well, like, in PA, I had to slow down all the time because like, they would be like, dude, you talk too fast. I'm like, New York. <laughs> guys, questions, comments, concerns. Please, do any not questions, feel. Seriously, like, yeah. I, I have a thick skin. Like, you can <clears throat> literally say pretty much anything to me and I'm not going to be offended. Or ask questions. And if it's okay with them, I think we can share this uh, presentation yes. with you guys so we can get some of the details that. So this is a, again, this is created by Naval Reactors, my boss uh, in DC. They, they basically, again, we build these programs, gear them for high school students just because that's our target market. But one of the things that I started to do, and, and senior chief over there can attest to this, one of the things I wanted to do since I came to the district was I wanted to get into colleges because I remember being in your seat. And I remember being a college student who maybe was going to college because I thought it was the right thing to do, but it just wasn't driven in the right direction. But I knew I liked science. Physics, engineering, math, and in high school, like, uh, I was great. But history, English, like, I, I'm not reading some stupid book, telling giving book report. I'm not telling you about some country I don't care about. But, you know, you let me give me a math test, I was ace in math tests. You know, give me physics, and I was able to tell you, you know, how if something worked. I, I'm an analytical mind. We're the type of people that the engineering programs, the nuclear power program looks for. So when I come into classes, I know out of 100 students, there's 10 out there that maybe we're gonna touch, that maybe need or would be interested in a program like this. Because realistically, do all of you have money to pay for another you know, living here? I went to community college because again, I didn't have the money to do it. I just liked college and hated classes. Uh, but realistically, like, our program is designed for people who are into engineering programs, but maybe necessarily don't know where they want to go with their, with their life yet, because we can help steer you in that right direction. I have college graduates with engineering degrees coming in and joining the enlisted program right now because there's no jobs for them, because these companies want experience. Now they see nuclear engineering and a degree on top of you, well now they're jumping at the chance to give you money. We literally have nuclear engineers in every, almost every major company you can think of. Uh, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, GE, Westinghouse, I have friends who work for all them. Here's the, the funny ones. She mentioned Pepsi earlier. We have engineers, nuclear engineers working for PepsiCo. Uh, Anheuser-Busch, Bausch & Lomb, Procter & Gamble. They're like, well, what do they do there? We have chemistry specialists or mechanics who specialize in chemistry for the nuclear reactors. And we talk about chemistry for the water and everything like that. My buddy got out of the Navy and works for Anheuser-Busch. You know what his job is? Check the water purity before he makes beer. He gets paid $80,000 a year to check water purity before they make it into beer. And he gets two cases of beer every week for it. I'm like, I want your job. <laughs> Pepsi, same thing. Before they, before they basically make Pepsi, they go through and they check all their the purity, acidity level before they can it. There's a, so many different avenues. You don't want to stay in the nuclear field? I have friends in generation, I have people in uh, transmission. So the power gets made on one end, they're the middleman who basically sits in a place, stares at these giant screens while playing Xbox, by the way, because that's what we used to do, play Xbox together. He'd be like, hang on a minute, and he'd pause his game, and I'd sit and wait, and I'd hear him in the background, like, all right, grid three, switch to grid two. All right, dude, thanks, man. And then he'd get back on, like, what'd you just do? He's like, oh, I just shifted half of California's power. What? Yeah, Northern California and Portland, they tie off to the same company. He shifted half of Northern California's power from one nuclear plant to the other. With just by talking to somebody, I'm like, you didn't do anything. You know, yeah. No, they paid me a lot of money to do this job. I'm like, oh, 110 a year back, back in 2010. Like, yeah, so the whole idea behind this presentation, guys, is for you to keep your options open. Again, you, we're not hoping that you take your life, uh, you know, the rest of your life into the Navy. If, if that's your call, by all means. But as he said, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly short commitment. You'll be there for a few years. 
you get your education, you get all your credentials, you get the experience, and then you move on to better opportunities if that's what you feel like it. But again, I do deal, just like he said, I do deal with a lot of graduates that earn their degrees and they come back to, yeah, I'm having a tough job, uh, I'm finding another job. So as you see, as you hear here, hey, this is almost guaranteed employment. So this is something for you guys to consider. Go with this. It's not just the vet status, which you, you should all understand vet status is a big deal. Your vet status and the most prestigious program that the military has to offer. Uh, I'll give you some statistics. 1% of the American population can and will join the military. So out of uh, 500 million people in the country, 1% of them can and will join the military. Of the military, not just Navy, of the military, the United States Navy's nuclear power program is top 3%. And that's not just me throwing numbers at you, that's statistically, because of how smart you have to be and how specialized our program is, we only take the top 3%. Now the SEALs, the spec work program, they always talk, top themselves as like the best of the best, great. And they are, and I have friends that are SEALs and, and they're amazing people. But I show them a, a page of math and his brain just starts to melt out his ear and he's just like, no, and I'm like, no, see, that's the thing. Companies want you because as a nuclear engineer, we teach you out of the box thinking. We teach you to problem solve. You're on a live nuclear reactor in the middle of the ocean while launching aircraft and going 35 miles an hour in one direction and literally something bad happens. And it's you and one other person. That person's been there three days. And they look at you like, I don't know what to do. And you're like, I got this. And the next thing you know, everything's fine. And they're like, what'd you do? And you're like, well, I did this and this and this. That's not what the book says. Well, this is better. That's out of, that's out of, the, book, out of the box thinking. Our program is designed to be very hands-on, very user-friendly, meaning we literally have thousands of giant books that teach you how to do it, but realistically, when you're down there, we want people who can think on their feet, and that's what these companies want. Facebook, they're not hiring nukes to be nuclear engineers for Facebook, we're data center engineers. I don't know anything about data center engineering, but I'm gonna run two data centers, why? Because I can look at you and be like, what's your job? You're my mechanic, all right, what's broke today? And you tell me, all right, you're gonna fix it by tomorrow, and then I put my foot where I need to. You're an electrician, all right, you're gonna go pick some electrical stuff. You're my HVAC system person. That's the thing, I can literally pick and choose what I need to fix. That's what the Navy taught me to do. That's why I'm gonna go get the nice big fat job and the nice big cushy chair. But those people all have engineering degrees. Anybody have any questions? Nobody? All right, it's 1.30, I don't wanna hold you guys any longer. Please, let's give them a warm round of applause. All right, so you guys have